Good evening. My name is Karen Dodson, the program director for the All of Us Research Program at the Medical College of Wisconsin. This presentation is sponsored by the All of Us Research Program. The future of health begins with you, advancing precision medicine through research. Today's topic, prostate cancer. Before I get started, I have a couple of housekeeping items. Our presentation today has two parts. The first is disease overview, and the second is ask the doctor a question and answer session. Please type your questions in the chat box or hold them for the question and answer section. Edwin Aldornado will be monitoring the chat. This presentation is being recorded. Recording will be made available on social media, YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. You have been muted by the host. Please stay on mute unless speaking. Also, we will be doing a drawing for $25 at the end of the presentation. So I'm hoping that you will be able to stay with us to that point. Prostate Cancer, All of You Health Education Series. Our first presenter, I would like to introduce to you is, to, is Taquanda Gilbert. She is a community program coordinator for the All of Us Research Program at the Medical College of Wisconsin. She has a degree in biological sciences, concentration on cell and molecular biology. She has five years experience in molecular dialysis and product development, including a 15 years of community work with the Nefatira African Dance Company. Taquanda? Thank you, Karen. Good evening, everyone. Thanks for joining us for our health education series for our topic of prostate cancer. So let's get started with an overview. So prostate cancer begins with cells in the prostate gland that start to grow and spread throughout the body. The prostate itself is a small walnut-shaped gland found in the pelvis of men. The function of the prostate is to produce fluid that nourishes and transports sperm. And it's the second leading cause of cancer death for men in the U.S. Next slide. So here are the stages of prostate cancer. In stage one, as you can see, the cancer is very small and it's contained only in the prostate. In stage two, the cancer is spreading between the two lobes, but it's still contained, contained within the prostate. In stage three, the cancer is starting to progress. Um, it's becoming larger in the prostate. And as you can see in the upper right-hand corner, it's starting to get closer to the vesicles. And stage four, the cancer has progressed um, fastly into the lymph nodes, and it can also progress throughout the body and reach other organs within the body, even bone, which can cause pain. So there are two types of prostate growth. The first one is benign, which is non-cancerous, and the second one is malignant, which is cancer. Um, the first one with benign, it's um, basically an enlargement of the prostate, so once the prostate is enlarged, it can cause squeezing of the urethra, which carries the urine from the bladder out to the body, which can cause um, pain during urination. It can be removed slowly and grow back very slowly, but it usually don't grow back. For a malignant growth, those are the um, prostate, prostate cancer itself. It spreads throughout the body and the cancer cells attach to other tissues and grow and damage that portion of the body. Um, it spreads through different organs and it can um, spread all throughout the body. And it also um, can be removed, but sometimes it may possibly grow back. So here are a couple of signs and symptoms. In early stages of prostate cancer often have no symptoms, but when symptoms do occur, it may necessarily not be prostate cancer. It can just be an enlargement of the prostate so they have um, similar similarities in symptoms. So it's always best to contact your healthcare provider just to learn the difference between the two so you can get the correct diagnosis. 
So we're going to do a little knowledge check now that I gave you a little bit of information about prostate cancer. So the question is, the symptoms of an enlarged prostate and prostate cancer can be very similar. So is this statement true or false? So you can put your answer in the chat or you can yell it out, whatever one you think it is. So I hope everyone was thinking true because that is correct. Um, they have very similar symptoms between an enlarged prostate and prostate cancer. So here are a couple of risk factors of prostate cancer, starting at the top with age. As men age, their risk of getting prostate cancer um, goes up. And with the damage of the genetic makeup of the prostate cells, it's more likely for, the, um, for men in the age of over 55. Moving down to race and ethnicity, African-American men are more likely to get prostate cancer in earlier ages, and they are more likely to have more aggressive tumors that spread and grow rapidly throughout the body. Moving down to obesity, um, maintaining a healthy weight is very important, and there's some evidence in men that who don't exercise um, have a higher risk of having prostate cancer, and it's always best to contact your um, a healthcare professional just to create um, a healthy weight loss plan. Moving down to diet, diet and lifestyle may have an effect of, um, um, of your risk of prostate cancer. And it's always best to um, have a variety of fruits, veggies, and whole grains in your body so your body can have those proper vitamins and nutrients. And again, it's always best to discuss this topic with your provider so you're getting the correct information. Moving along to family history. Men with a family history of prostate cancer also face a higher risk of developing the disease. And a man is two to three times more likely to have prostate cancer if his father, brother, or son has had it. And then down to chemicals, smoking is a factor and the risk may double for heavy smokers. So it's always best to avoid smoking. And cigarette smoking has a closer relationship to prostate cancer for African-American men than those who are Caucasian. So here are some diagnoses of prostate cancer. For um, the first one, the uh, digital rectal examination, and the last one, the blood test. These two tests are used to screen for prostate cancer. They are both used to, um, to detect it. And any abnormal results don't necessarily mean that you have prostate cancer, but it can be due to an enlarged prostate or possible infection. For the other three, the ultrasound, MRI, and the urine sample, these are um, ways to confirm if you have prostate cancer or not. So um, most of the time people use a urine sample or a biopsy, which is just a minor surgery where they use tiny pieces of tissue sample to look for those cancer cells. So for prostate cancer treatment, moving towards the left, um, late stage diagnoses, even though prostate cancer and a large prostate have similar symptoms, you don't wanna wait too late where um, it can lead to bone pain because that can be a serious uh, complication. And early detection is always best when staying consistent with your yearly checkups, especially for those men that are 55 and um, older. Towards the middle, um, risky surgeries. Um, it'll take about four to six hours to come to perform a prostatectomy, which is just the removal of cancer cells. Um, and you can use a, lose about four to five units of blood. Now we're trying to move into robotic assistance where the procedure is um, sm uh, shorter in time and minimum blood is lost and you'll have a faster recovery. And then, the last um, treatment option is standard options, where providers use a one-size-fits-all technique, where um, everyone gets the same um, treatments and prescribed until they're fit, until they're failed. And now we're trying to move into precision medicine. So precision medicine is just um, healthcare that is based on you as an individual, and they take into account of factors of where you live, what do you do, and your family history. And the All of Us Research Program is a part of the Precision Medicine Initiative to help researchers understand why people get sick or stay healthy. So just to wrap up everything on prevention, 
So the first tip is to eat healthy. I know it's hard for um, men just to move away from their um, meat and potatoes, but it's always best to add a little bit of green um, from your veggies, fruits, or whole grains. You wanna just make sure that you add those in your um, daily diet and always seek out professional help to get a plan. To move more, exercise also play um, an important part. Um, we just wanna make sure you keep moving, stay consistent with your exercise routines. I know it's kind of hard during COVID to use, utilize the gyms, but any type of movement is always best, even if it's from your at-home workouts or doing yard work. Quit smoking. That is always most important. And um, you wanna try to avoid it at all costs, even though if you have any other underlying health is uh, issues, you wanna avoid smoking. And then last, you wanna get regular checkups, especially for our men that are 55 plus, we wanna make sure you're consistent with those checkups. Yes, yeah, sometimes your significant other may nag you about going to the doctor, but they're only doing it because they love you and really want you to get things checked out and make sure everything is okay. So our last knowledge check, how might the All of Us Research Program impact prostate cancer treatment in the future? Is it A, robotic assistance, B, precision medicine, or C, surgeries? What do you guys think? A, B, or C? I hope everyone was thinking B. The answer is precision medicine. So participants of the All of Us Research Program donate this, um, their unique health information through a series of surveys about their um, basic life and um, health history. And we would like for you to share your medical, um, electronic medical record, along with physical measurements and a blood and urine sample. So this way, research can use this information and make different connections on how um, people say, stay healthy or get sick. And these connections can lead to other ways to diagnose people. And this diagram here is just basically explaining um, a plan of a researcher of how they use precision medicine, which um, they can include gene infusions or gene editing. So this is just um, prostate cancer could be one example of the things that researchers will research if you join the program. So now it's time for our question and answer portion. And I would like to introduce Dr. Kenneth Jacobson and you can take it away. <laughs> Hello, I'll introduce Mr. Jacobson. Excuse me, my name is Edwin Maldonado. I'm the program manager for the All of Us uh, Research Program. And Dr. Jacobson is a fellowship trained in minimally invasive urologically oncology and board certified in urology. urology. He's an expert in robotic assisted laparoscopic surgery for prostate cancer, kidney cancer, and bladder cancer. He specializes in robotics, and laparoscopic surgery for benign urologic diseases. Welcome Dr. Jacobson to our session here today. And I just wanna remind everybody that if you do have any questions, please enter those in the chat box and I will be reading those out. And, or if you'd like to ask a question, just mention something in chat and I'll put you live so you can actually ask them the question. Dr. Jacobson, thank you, welcome. And is there anything you'd like to add to the presentation so far? Uh, well, uh, thank you very much. It's really uh, a joy to be here, um, and, and I appreciate the kind introduction. I would like to add that I think I need to find a way for Taquanda to come work in our department um, because that was a fantastic. Uh, <laughs> thank you, thank you. Uh, room for smart, knowledgeable people, Taquanda. So, uh, find me later. <laughs> Great. Um, no, I, I think that was a very thorough talk. I'm not seeing any questions coming through just yet. Okay. So. I have a couple that came through on my end over here. One of them is, is what are the chances that the cancer can spread beyond the prostate? Yeah, so um, everybody's unique that way. So most of what we see in terms of prostate cancer is what we call adenocarcinoma of the prostate. That represents 99% of prostate cancers. Um, and that just adenocarcinoma refers to the cell type. 
Uh, but prostate cancers can vary quite widely, and the two things that we look at in anybody with a new diagnosis are grade and stage. And grade refers to how aggressive the cancer is, and stage refers to where the cancer is located. Um, and it's the combination of those two that help us understand um, uh, really what a prognosis may be. So for many patients who may have a cancer which is low grade, and those are our most common prostate cancers, the risk of spreading beyond the gland is often quite low. And there are many patients that we observe when we don't actually treat them. For patients on the other end of the spectrum with high grade cancers, the risk that it could spread beyond the prostate is actually quite high. So if you know someone or you yourself are dealing with a prostate cancer, there are some ways to calculate the risk that the cancer has spread beyond the gland. Um, there is a nomogram. A nomogram is a risk calculator that I like to use uh, from Memorial Sloan Kettering. That's MSKCC, Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. You type that prostate cancer nomogram, MSKCC, into Google. It'll pull up that risk calculator. And if you enter all the things that you know about your prostate cancer, the biopsy, your PSA, your age, um, it will go ahead and tell you what the percentages are that it's spread beyond the gland. So um, it's hard to answer that question without specifics about a specific tumor. Um, but the, the answer uh, overall is that uh, it can vary quite widely and we have to individualize that sort of evaluation. Thank you. Another question is, uh, what are the risks and benefits of prostate cancer screening? Ooh, great question. Well, <clears throat> overall, I think knowledge is power. So um, the main benefit is we find out whether or not you in fact have prostate cancer. Um, and that gives opportunity. So earlier diagnosis, means more potential treatment options, means a better chance for cure, and consequently fewer side effects of treatment or fewer side effects of the disease having spread. So that's the big win. Now, what are the risks? Well, the screening itself isn't terribly risky. It's a blood draw and a rectal exam, a digital rectal exam. That's the uncomfortable part. It's not really risky, other than it might not be, uh, you know, the most fun. Um, but that's the screen. There's nothing more to it. Now, what are the consequences of perhaps not getting a perfect score on your screen? Well, we uh, might see things like you need more x-rays, you need more biopsies, or you need a biopsy, you need more lab draws. That causes anxiety, that causes stress, perhaps some financial problems in terms of paying for these things. So I wouldn't, maybe risk is the wrong word, but those are the consequences of sort of opening up the box to find out what's in there. Um, but, you know, the reality is we live in a world with a lot of prostate cancer, a lot of other health problems, mm -hmm. and it is so much more empowering to walk in there early and find out how you're doing than it is to wait until it's too late. Great point. Very true. Now, I know that um, Taquanda mentioned that chances are higher if your father, brother, or son have prostate cancer. Can this be also carried down from another relative that might be like an uncle or a grandparent? Great question. So the short answer to that question is I, all first degree relatives are considered um, high risk. So to put you in a high risk category. So I call that father, brother, uncle. Mm -hmm. Now there are a small subset of patients, uh, of male patients who have a mutation called a BRCA1 gene. Um, and they uh, likely is a gene that's carried in multiple generations in a family. Uh, and often that gene is attributed to breast cancer as well. So if you've got a family history of young patients, even if it's a grandfather with a young aggressive prostate cancer, multiple women with breast cancer at a young age, 
These are people who, uh, while it may not be the common thing we talk about, also puts us at risk. Now, the other things to really pay attention to, if we go consider that slide that Taquanda put up about the other things that put us at risk besides genetics, is lifestyle. So, um, uh, I, I would, uh, if I had my druthers, though this is not the way any of these slides look, I would say the number one risk factor for getting prostate cancer outside of being a man, because of course women don't have prostates, um, the number one risk factor is living in a Western society and, and living a Western lifestyle, consuming unhealthy foods, not exercising, having too much stress, um, these are the things that put us at biggest risk. And the genetic predisposition is probably only 20%. So there are populations on the planet historically, um, even some of West African heritage, that don't do the things that we do here. Um, and their rates of prostate cancer are the lowest ever recorded. So among the diet, among the lifestyle things which put us at the biggest risk, um, diet is number one, um, and there are foods which are specifically implicated in the risk of prostate cancer. Uh, the worst of all in my, uh, in my interpretation of the literature is dairy. So uh, any derivation of animal milk. Um, the others which have been implicated are very common foods, and that's chicken and poultry, uh, poultry rather, and eggs. So poultry, whether it's chicken, turkey, duck, uh, eggs, all contain a molecule called choline. And choline is specifically implicated in the development and progression of prostate cancer. And as also as Taquanda so very clearly stated earlier, obesity is a huge risk factor. So if you eat a lot of dairy and you eat a lot of poultry and you eat a lot of eggs, which is staples in the standard American diet and staples in the um, staples in Western diet, uh, you are going to likely be obese or overweight. Uh, Two-thirds of Americans are obese or overweight. If you're lean, you're in the minority, you're in the minority in this country, and those numbers get worse every single day. So taking care of our risk factors, no matter what our genetics say, is the number one thing that people can do today so that they don't end up in my clinic. Great, thank you. Uh, we have a question here. How can family members encourage the males in their family to feel more comfortable in going for their annual prostate checkup, especially if some don't like to go to the doctor? Yeah, great question. So this comes down to figuring out why someone might be motivated to do something different than they've always done. So in terms of health care, we know that women are far more likely to attend to their health than men are. Um, we've got this uh, sort of cultural attitude that it's not macho to go in, that men can take care of it themselves. I don't see it that way. I, I, I see how that exists in culture, but to me, what's being macho is being healthy and being available to take care of yourself and take care of your family. So um, you have to figure out why people might do differently than they've always done. So is it that, um, is it a matter of uh, figuring out what their fear is? Why wouldn't you go in? Um, often I say to patients when they're contemplating some sort of modification to lifestyle or management of their disease, is to say, are you happy with your results? Are you happy with how healthy you are? Are you happy with having to be here? Because if you are, then you should keep doing what you're doing. Stay on the couch, don't get screened, continue to eat junk food. But if you want something different, if you want different than you've got, if you want different than your neighbors have, if you want different than your father, brother, uncle, then you must do something the exact opposite of what you've always done, no matter what the fear of that may be. Um, but the reality is getting in early, getting off that couch gives you the most opportunity, the most opportunity to have a good result. 
Um, and so uh, sometimes we just have to um, leave behind our modesty um, and understand that there are professionals willing to take care of us if we just allow it. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, what is the remission rate for prostate cancer today compared to a few decades ago? And is it better or the same and why the change, if any? So remission isn't a word we use in prostate cancer like we do in other diseases. That's often um, often uh, used in some bloodborne or lymphatic borne malignancies where we can make things just kind of disappear. Um, we do talk cure rates in prostate cancer, and we talk, uh, so the, the two things that I think are probably the best endpoints in terms of prostate cancer are overall survival, meaning after a diagnosis, how long are you likely to live? And then cancer-specific survival. So after a prostate cancer diagnosis, how likely are you to live how likely are you to die from the prostate cancer? The difference between those two is the major difference in terms of what do most prostate cancer patients die from? And it's not prostate cancer, it's heart disease, right? So heart disease is our number one killer in men and women um, across this country, and that's been long standing. Uh, so cardiovascular disease, stroke, diabetes, cancer's up on the list, but it's, but it's not as high as some of those others. So the cure rate, so yes, we do have uh, remission, but we call it cure. Um, cure rates are better for lower risk, lower stage disease, lower risk meaning less aggressive, less advanced, earlier diagnosis, um, but it's a broad spectrum. Um, the Patients who are diagnosed with disease which is confined to their prostate, so people who came in early, we catch the disease before it's advanced beyond the prostate, have extremely high re uh, cure rates. Um, and I think that those numbers are, in fact, better than they were years ago. Um, people with advanced disease may not, in fact, find cure, but the cancer-specific survival is better than ever before. So. We have many new treatments available for people with advanced disease. Um, and we are able to uh, help patients live longer in a quality way than we ever did decades ago when we had very few treatments available. So while that may not be remission, um, their cancer-specific survival, death from prostate cancer, has gone way down. Great to hear that. Now, I know that many men sometimes will think that they're having is hemorrhoid issues when they see blood and they tend not to go in. Um, so if I know that Taquanda mentioned some of the symptoms to watch out for. Um, I know for me personally, I went in thinking uh, I had uh, cancer and found out all I had was an enlarged prostate because the symptoms are very similar. So my question is, if you do have an enlarged prostate, what are the odds of later on that affecting you to become, to get prostate cancer? So having an enlarged prostate is quite common. Okay. Uh, um, at least in the urology office is quite common, but it, it's quite common. The prostate's one of these, uh, the prostate just keeps growing as we get older. Mm -hmm. um, it's like our hair or our nose. It just keep, you know, keeps getting larger over time. It never really stops growing. Um, unless we do something to make it stop growing. So eventually, at some point, it's going to get above average in size. Now, none of that size of the prostate has no correlation with risk of prostate cancer at all. Um, and size of the prostate also doesn't have all that much correlation with the amount of symptoms you might have from an enlarged prostate. It has more to do with where the uh, prostate has grown. Has it grown to narrow the channel for urination? Uh -huh. Um, or not. So um, the reason we screen people for prostate cancer, the reason it's worth our time to check it out early in the absence of symptoms and be very, let me be very clear that the overwhelming majority of patients diagnosed with prostate cancer have no symptoms at all. So the reason it's important to screen 
is because we need because it doesn't cause any symptoms. It doesn't often cause the urinary symptoms, um, which she talked about. It can in very late and advanced stages, but most often it doesn't cause uh, any symptoms at all. Right. And what would you recommend at what age should men start getting checkups uh, for possible prostate or just for a prostate checkup? So um, there are a variety of recommendations out there by different national bodies. Um, and this has been a very confusing space and a very complicated space. Um, so for men who, I, I choose a, sort of a hybrid model, uh, but any of them are fine, really. So for men at average risk, you live a Western lifestyle, you have no first degree relatives uh, with prostate cancer, uh, your likelihood of being of West African descent is exceedingly rare, um, then I would recommend a beginning screening at age 55. If any of the others are true, uh, you've got a first degree relative with prostate cancer, father, brother, uncle. Uh, you're of West African heritage, or you might be. Um, then I would drop that number way down. And uh, for me, I would say it, it doesn't hurt to get a first PSA between 40 and 45. If that's fine, you're probably good for five years. Um, but if it's not fine, that's the time we want to know about it. Um, so moving that time point early, again, gives us the opportunity to catch it before it comes a problem. Sounds great. Thank you so much. Apparently, I think we are out of questions, but uh, for everybody who's listening, first of all, thank you, Dr. Jacobson, 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 excuse me. I learned a lot from you already myself. Um, so uh, if anybody has further questions, please, Feel free to uh, email us or text it online. Uh, we will be posting the answers and these questions and the recording online. So it will be available again, Dr. Jacobson. Thank you so much for sharing your knowledge with us. And on the screen, you'll see there are some trusted sites for more information about it. NIH National Cancer Institute um, and websites there, the American Cancer Society and the Mayo Clinic. So if you want to know more about it, please feel free to call us or go online and look at some of these resources. We'd be more than happy to assist you with any answers. Thank you for your time, Dr. Jacobson. Thank you everybody for the question and answer period. And I'm gonna pass it over to Karen. Thank you, Karen. Okay. Okay, thank you. Um, just wanted to, I just had a question because I'm just wondering if some people really had some challenges with um, trying to ask questions and so I wanted to make sure that we give people a chance in an opportunity. So I guess I wanted to ask before we do close things out, are there any other questions that people might have? And Edwin or Christian, can you open up the line just to make sure if people have questions? Because we do have a little bit more time. Person, you going to be able to do that. Okay. Okay. Apparently, let me. Uh, okay. Or if you if you are interested, anybody, you can hit the space bar. It'll open it up so you can ask questions. So feel okay. free to uh, jump in if you have a question. Thank you. I just want to make sure that people do have a chance and sure. opportunity, because we do have um, some time, and you know it's kind of rare that we get a chance to talk to. Uh, a doctor and ask questions, you know, straight on. So if you do have other questions, please feel free. If someone else have other questions in the chat, I want to make sure we give people yeah. enough time. Sure. I got another question that came in in chat. Have you done any research looking if there is a connection between damage to the gut microbiome and prostate cancer? This one's for the doc. Good question. Um, that is, so the gut microbiome for people who aren't, uh, who are listening that maybe say that's a term I've never heard of. The gut microbiome refers to the bacteria which live in our um, gastrointestinal tract. 
we actually have more bacteria in our gut than we do human cells. Um, and we live with them uh, in a healthy symbiotic relationship. Um, it was about, oh, I don't know, seven or eight years ago that people started to really look into uh, the gut microbiome and uh, how diverse it can be and how it looks different in healthy patients versus unhealthy patients. Um, so it is very much a new field of study, but one which holds a lot of promise. Um, I'm not aware yet of any great data on a gut microbiome and development of prostate cancer. Uh, we could make somewhat of a secondary uh, hypothesis, however, uh, understanding that what makes a healthy gut microbiome is a healthy diet. And the people who have the best, most versatile gut microbiome consume between 30 and 40 different whole plant foods on a weekly basis. So if you're eating a wide variety of plants, chances are there's not a lot of room in your diet for unhealthy foods. Also, if you're eating 30 to 40 plants, chances are you exercise regularly. You probably don't smoke. Um, you can manage your stress. So there are a variety of things that go along with um, doing that, particularly if you do it intentionally. And what I mean by that is you decide, I'm going to eat, um, you know, a, I'm going to set out to eat a wide variety of plants. And there are people who accomplish that without a lot of intention because their lifestyles are set up that way. They're not eating at McDonald's. Um, they probably live in a remote uh, part of the world with a community that intentionally eats healthy food. Um, but so healthy gut microbiome equals uh, lower risk of chronic diseases. The causes of chronic disease are the same things which cause prostate cancer. Um, so that's the hypothesis, but the studies really aren't there yet. Okay, great. Dr. Uh, Dr. Uh, Jacobson, I just have a question for you when you talk about the hypothesis. Can you just explain that to people a little bit more? It's a theory, right? So a hypothesis means uh, uh, we have a guess that that might in fact be true. Um, so the guess in this scenario is eating healthy food equals healthy bacteria in our gut equals a healthy body equals lower risk of prostate cancer. Um, but there are a lot of other things which go into that, and so it can be difficult to prove. It can be a difficult uh, question to get to the bottom of. Thank you. Then I have another question for you. Um, what do you really suggest for people? I know you talk about the eating and exercise. Um, are, are there any other things that you really suggest that people should be aware or make um, some different um, life changes on. Yeah. So, uh, what, so yes, what are the pillars of a healthy lifestyle? Uh, well, diet's probably 80% of it. Um, and the evidence is overwhelmingly clear in that regard that eating a diet which is plant focused, whole plant foods, unprocessed foods is the way to go. Um, we do need to make sure we're getting enough exercise. Adults should be getting two and a half hours of moderate to vigorous exercise on a weekly basis. Moderate to vigorous means you could talk, but you couldn't sing while you're doing it. That could be a brisk walk. That could be lifting weights. It doesn't have to be at a gym. Um, if your gym is closed due to COVID or you don't belong to a gym, um, it can just be going for a walk around the block or a walk around your house or up and down the stairs. It doesn't really matter. The point is you're moving your body. Um, we need to get enough sleep. So if we're not sleeping well, that adds uh, to inflammation in the body. Sleep is the time where our body restores itself. Uh, most people need between seven and eight hours of sleep on a nightly basis. 
believe it or not, you cannot make up for lost time. So like if you if you just say, hey, I'm gonna only get three hours every weekday and on the weekend I'm gonna sleep 12 to make up for it, even if you do, that doesn't really count. So it's a nightly basis. It's just a matter, uh, so there are a lot of reasons to not sleep. Come to my house, I'll introduce you to a few. But, uh, <laughs> you know, sometimes it's as simple as saying, I'm not going to turn on that stupid TV show at 9 o'clock at night, or I am going to put my phone down uh, early and intentionally get to bed early, because we all have at some point or another put together a few good nights of sleep, and you know how good you start to feel. Mm -hmm. uh, stress management. So there are many things we can't control, but often we can control our response to stress. So what are ways to manage stress? Uh, well, meditation's a good one. Uh, yoga's a good one. Deep breathing is a good one. Um, there are many uh, free resources out there in terms of meditation if you've never tried it. There are some uh, apps that you can pay for that aren't terribly expensive. Uh, um, so I and there's lots of free yoga out on the web or, or around town places you can find it. Uh, yoga's about as cheap an exercise as you can find, even if you go so far as to invest in a mat for fifteen dollars. Um, you're not going to find much cheaper than that, and you don't really even need a mat to do. Um, and then of course avoiding risky uh, substances is is super important. So tobacco's in there, smoking's in there alcohols in there. There is no safe limit to alcohol. We do say no more than two drinks a day for a man, no more than one for a woman. Um, but the reality is two a day, maybe more than any man should probably have in the long run. And then of course, all sorts of uh, other illicit uh, drugs on the list uh, as well. Okay. I know we, we, we do have some resources for people as far as different sites that they can um, kind of look at what's going on and how they can get more information. But do you know of anything as far as what your recommendation will be for those individuals as far as looking at support programs or things like that in that nature? So, um, yes. Uh, now, most of the resources that I have, unfortunately, aren't entirely free. Uh, of course, I'm making no money off them. These aren't paid endorsements uh, as a disclosure. I make no money by sending somebody to an app. Um, personally, for meditation, I use an app called Headspace. Um, I know some other people who like um, who like uh, Calm, C-A-L-M, or 10% Happier. Um, any one of them are fine. There are free resources out there. You could look for free meditation as well. Um, there's a great uh, website, which is entirely free. You have to register for it for yoga, but uh, most of the content is free called doyogawithme.com. Um, doyogawithme.com, believe it or not. So like yoga and meditation probably five years ago were two things I would have never said in, in a million years you'd find me doing. Um, but believe it or not, they're a regular part of my life. Um, and, and I do think that they're a tremendous benefit in terms of overall health. Um, and, you know, doing both of those has been found to help uh, with sleep. And there aren't a lot of resources necessarily so uh, on, on sleep behaviors, although there are, you know, there are clearly, you know, proper practices, you know, don't go eat a big meal before dinner. Don't exercise before bed. Don't exercise before bed. Um, you know, calm down. Turn off the turn off the lights. Turn off the the screens 30 minutes before you go to sleep. All these things can and do help. Make sure it's a dark environment. Make sure it's not noisy. Some of these are the problems I have in my house. Uh, <laughs> Unfortunately, get rid of your wife and children uh, in terms of sleep does not really work. The, in the end, you don't sleep better, but it might make. Yeah, I don't suggest that, Dr. Jacobson. <laughs> might make for one good open. sleep, but in the end, you're probably not going to not going to sleep any better. Um, so, um, you know, as far as quitting smoking, uh, quitting smoking is very, very uh, challenging to do. The overwhelming majority of people who quit smoking do it cold turkey. There are, in fact more non uh, ex smokers than there are current smokers but quitting cold turkey is about um 
it, it's extremely unsuccessful in its own, even though even though that's the way the majority of people do it. The best way to do it actually is with some pharmaceutical help. Um, and so talking to your primary care doctor about that would be a smart move. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, it looks like we don't have any more questions. And as we do have on the screen, some resources for you. Um, so now um, I just wanna mention to people that thank you Dr. Jacobson, first of all, for your presentation and uh, just really allowing for us to hear more about prostate cancer. And thank you for the hard work that you're doing in this field. It's very impressive. And uh, thank you for taking the time to work with us on that and present. Okay, um, next we're gonna have a drawing for people. And um, I'm going to look at our participants to see exactly um, individuals and I'll do a drawing at this time. So be patient with me. Okay, if your initials are O and G, we will be contacting you within the next 48 hours. Um, you will get a $25 cash and then they'll contact you as the best way as far as being able to uh, get that in, to get that to you. We have some upcoming sessions and the next one is gonna be on diabetes, but it's gonna be also in Spanish. We had that one two weeks ago in English. So if you are still in need of information related to diabetes, you can access it um, through our Facebook and also there'll be other information that we'll be sending to you as well. Um, so diabetes in Spanish is gonna be September 16th. It will be presented in Spanish. So we're excited about that. And then following, we'll have the sickle cell disease, September 30th. After each event, please take a moment to complete the short survey, or you can also email us at all of us at mcw.edu for your suggestions. If you have any other questions, you can always contact me. I'm the program director. Um, and also our, our um, line for the All of Us Research Program is 414-955-2689. We're lo located in the Curita building. However, right now we are not taking walk-ins. So we had suggest that you do call us if you have questions or information related to the All of Us Research Program, or if you have questions about today's presentation as well. You can also go to all of us at mcwedu as well as at all of us mke or you can also join all of us dot org slash wisconsin um, so we are so excited that you were able to join us today and we look forward to seeing you in the next presentations everyone have a good day evening i should say thank you <laughs>